All right, I hereby call the 2021 annual meeting of the Everest Basin District Alliance to order. Um, welcome everyone. We have uh, a number of people online. We have currently uh, 11 people in the room. Um, so I think, why don't we have Rock share who's online so that we can then uh, go through the room as well. Okay, so I will try to do affiliations where I know. Um, but online we have uh, Neil Manny, Brad Chenoweth, Charles Atkins, Christina Curtis uh, with the City of Everett, Chuck Watts is on the board uh, of the SBA, Corey Burke on the board of the SBA, Elton Liu, who's no tracks, uh, a mayor for this that member with and also helps with the SBA. Uh, Eric Ashley Benke is now transit for the SAS from the House of Hope, Gabriel Black uh, with Hope Works Citizenship Program. Uh, Joe Sieber is on the SBA's board, Kate Barnes of the city, uh, Molly Faye Cruz uh, with United Way on the board, uh, Nick Bratton with Portera on the board, and Old Pedro Kaiser Permente with Old Weber with the city. Uh, I think I forget the first name here because it's not listed, but I think Portia Williams uh, with CCI, uh, P uh, Ben Kong with PSRC. Uh, Roland B.E. with Community Transit and on the board. Andrew Stringham, uh, Steve, I don't know Steve's last name, Jennifer Cross uh, with the Dog Spot on the board. Um, just to jump around. Sylvia Anderson with the Everett Gospel Mission. Uh, Vince Griscus with uh, Everett Transit. I think I have got everybody here. If we could do a quick one so around the room. Yes. Yep. So I'm Ed Peterson, I'm the president of the Everest District Alliance Board of Directors. We have an owl here, which so I'm told is, I don't know if that's a nickname or no, that's that's it. So, uh, and that's uh, um, provided by Delta Marriott Hotel for our benefit today. And the general manager of the Delta Marriott Hotel with us, and so I'm going to start with you and go once around the, the room with the, uh, uh, please provide your name and your affiliation. Sure. I, yes. I was just, before we do, we we have a speaker and also an audio thing that's picking up everybody in the room, and I saw things in the comments that was hard to hear. Um, all audio in the room is going through the speaker, and so we need to speak as if we're talking to the person across the room. Uh, I think we're important enough. So speak loudly. Yes. Introduction. Danielle. Yes, so I'm Danielle Cavoto and I work for Hollander Hospitality and um, I've been with them for 19 years. So I'm new to the Delta. Um, I just started at the beginning of August. So <clears throat> getting oriented with a brand new property coming off of uh, Delta, very, uh, the Delta virus, not the hotel. And um, yes, just getting brought up to speed in the community and uh, Happy to have an in-person meeting because I think this is the first one that I've had in a long time. So, yes. So, well, before we go further, thank you, Danielle, for uh, donating the space for us today. Um, it's an awesome room, uh, well wired, and a uh, good location, easily accessible. And uh, we thank you very much. Uh, please pass the thanks on to your organization. I will, absolutely. Going further to <laughs> So Jim Kinnaman is with uh, Sharon Wells Community Bike Shop on the uh, I am the board president. Uh, we're not located in the other station district, uh, but we're nearby, uh, just north uh, of the QFC. And we have a strong interest in bike, pedestrian, transit interaction, and hope that uh, to uh, continue to encourage the SBA to uh, support that as well. Thank you. Patrick Hall with the Downtown Ever Association. Paul Spring, uh, landscape architect. I don't represent the city first, but I also work for a large municipality, um, which are in Everett. But I'm here representing the city first, not the city. But, um, Thanks for being here, Paul. And please, uh, everybody, speak as loud as you can in the room so that those that are online can hear it. Tom? Um, 
Yeah, I'm uh, Tom Kosczynski. I'm the Chief Advancement Officer at Compass Health, uh, sitting in for our CEO, Tom Sebastian. Let's go to the back of the room. Joe, can you introduce yourself? I'm uh, Joe Kunzler, Regional Transit Advocate, and I'm just here for the transit briefings. Um, and I hope everyone can hear me okay. Thank you very much, Sean. I'm John Trainer. I'm the Political Director of IBW 191. We represent 2,400 election workers in the Everett government. Nicole Moore, representing United Way of Ty Farrell, I'm on the uh, Everett Station District Alliance Board. Mary Fossey, Everett City Council District Alliance Board. Hello, I'm Paula Ryan, Everett City Council District 2 elect. Brock Howell, Director. All right, so let me just uh, walk us through a couple of items as background to get everybody on the same page. Um, our agenda today is going to be two hours, and we've got a lot of content we want to cover. This is uh, our once a year opportunity to uh, share what uh, the Alliance has been doing, issues that are prevalent in the neighborhood, opportunities that we see for the next year. Um, so we will cover these topics as uh, we go. We have time frames for each. We hope we can hold to those. And, the last item at 1.30 is a very important one for the Everett Station area. That's the uh, presentation and discussion about business improvement area. We have a board of directors that currently today have 14 members. They're listed on the left and a staff of three that are listed on the right. We have a membership of uh, some uh, several dozen uh, members who pay their dues of $25 and participate in our meetings and activities and neighborhood cleanups and et cetera. We have a, a growing number of supporters, financial supporters who have helped us uh, this past year and continue to be supporters uh, for the work of this organization. Um, and one of the exciting things that's happened this past year is the establishment of district in the city of Everett. Uh, this organization and this neighborhood have not really had clear lines of communication established with our city up until now. And that's both with the city administration and with the city council. Uh, so it's quite uh, exciting to have the uh, individuals elected uh, in our city, uh, which uh, representatives from uh, the District 1 on the north end, the top of the map, and District 2 in the middle of the map, uh, chair the Everest Station District uh, neighborhood. Um, basically, the way I describe it is east of the tracks to the, free, to the, uh, to the freeway is District 1, and west of the tracks to Broadway in District 2. And so we have the two newly elected city council members with us and we invited them to take five minutes and uh, share who, uh, their thoughts on the uh, new city council members and a little bit about their backgrounds. So let's start with District 1 and that would be Mary Fossey. We'll let you come up here and use the podium. People online can also clap as a clap feature. <laughs> <laughs> so resounding applause for Mary Ann. Yeah. Hi, Tech. Okay, so this is actually a uh, first time out speaking since uh, everything happened. So I'm honored to be here. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Mary Fossey, and uh, I live in the Delta neighborhood in Everett, and uh, I am in District 1. And I'm really, really proud to be a part of the Everett City Council's first ever districts, as well as the first ever woman majority that the city's had on our council. And that's a really exciting achievement. Uh, the, my background for those of you that I haven't met, uh, I currently work in the legislature, but 
Uh, I've been a business owner for the last decade in Everett, and I have past experience as an operations manager and employment specialist. But most people in the community know me through my community advocacy work, uh, working uh, as a neighborhood chair and you know advocacy on a variety of like environmental justice programs and, and other things that really kind of helped with our neighborhood and our community uh, advocating for equitable infrastructure. And so that's how I really uh, became kind of involved and invested in my district. And my family, I, I live in Delta with my husband, two kids, our dog and chickens. And uh, we, we really love our neighborhood. Um, I think it's really special, but there are some lacking amenities that I think would make it a more livable and walkable community. And I feel like that's kind of an issue across the city. That's what our community wants. Uh, we want that transit oriented developments, the safe sidewalks, and, you know, our bike lanes and easy ways to, to get around mobility wise. So that background along with a lived experience in homelessness and childhood poverty uh, have kind of shaped my priorities going forward for the Ever City Council. So on the top of our agenda, obviously it's going to be addressing a lot of our homelessness issues and the kind of mitigating factors that go into that, uh, including you know, the lack of an access to affordable housing and uh, a lot of our mental health issues and a lot of those gaps, those services. So I know that we'll be working hard to address some of those issues. Uh, and then I think why I'm so excited about the work that's being done here is because coming from that community advocacy background and, and trying to you know, solve the issues of kind of a lack of comprehensive development, you really have that going forward in what, what's happening in the district. So it's, it's really exciting, the, the work that you have going on here. And I'm very thrilled going forward to, to watch what, what happens. Thank you so much for uh, having me here and uh, reach out to me if anyone has any questions. So the Delta neighborhood, I think, is the uh, gray one up here on the top of the map. Uh, and Mary was the chair of the Delta neighborhood, neighborhood Association for how long? A few years, yeah. A few years, yeah. okay. Uh, and then Paula Ryan is uh, from the Second district, district two, and uh, we're actually a part. The geography here is a part of the Fort Gardner Neighborhood Association. So there's an interesting overlap here between an existing neighborhood and uh, a wannabe neighborhood, <laughs> uh, if you will. And so Paula, district two, new city council member. Right. Okay. 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 Thank you everybody. I'm really glad to be here today. My name is Paula Ryan. I'm city council member elect for Everett City Council District 2. As you can see from the map, it goes from the port uh, through downtown and over to the train station, the eventual light rail station as well, and then all those neighborhoods south, uh, leaving off at the Wood Creek neighborhood. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, this is one of my very first speeches, especially my first speech in person as a newly elected official. And I'm really proud that it's here with Everett Station District Alliance. The, uh, convergence uh, project is something that I'm really excited about. I'm really looking forward to how it's going to make a transformative impact on Everett and for the folks that are going to be able to utilize it in the future. Uh, a little bit about myself. I have a 20 year background uh, professionally, politically, uh, uh, volunteer wise and education wise. I'm a two time uh, proud graduate of the University of Washington, first with a uh, bachelor's in political science and second with a master's in public administration. I just feel Tom. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, I've also uh, previously worked, uh, previously volunteered with the University District Food Bank and served on their uh, food bank board uh, for six years, ending in a, a president role. Um, I've also previously worked for the Affordable Housing Program at the Federal Home Loan Bank of Seattle and worked for the King County Council and I currently work for the Snohomish County Council. Uh, so I have a long, uh, long background with a lot of different policy areas that, I've all, that I see a lot of convergences with, uh, with this project. I ran on a two-tier platform of housing and homelessness issues and the economic recovery from COVID. And uh, I see a lot of intersections between these two policy areas and what's going on with this project. 
And there's a lot of other intersections that I'm also really excited about, uh, including uh, thoughtful and functional transit oriented development, access to childcare, uh, considerations and implementation of walking, biking, and other non motorized transportation options, the historic preservation and celebration of Everett's uh, blue collar past, and, uh, and the convergence of that with Everett's future as well environmental considerations and ensuring that any um, infrastructure that's put in has a, a mitigating compounding effect on the environment and all of this through an overarching lens of uh, equity and social justice so i want to thank partners for all their hard work to put this project uh, literally on the map and keep it moving forward i look forward to being a great partner and look forward to um, doing my best to to support this project in the future through whether it's future cleanups <laughs> of the area or just uh, what I can do on council to help celebrate and uh, support the effort. So thank you so much. Great new energy on the city council. We're looking forward to the dialogue and the opportunities to think strategically about our community and, and about the transit center and uh, the future of this transit center as a point of pride in our community and an access point for citizens of our city to go places and for people from outside of our community to come to Everett and enjoy its benefits. So thank you both for taking the time and being with us. And we're proud to be the first uh, opportunity for you to speak to your public. Um, so now we're going to move ahead to the uh, State of the District Report. Uh, Brock Howell, our executive director, uh, is going to give, run us through what happened in this past year. Thank you, electronic stay. But um, thank you, uh, Paul and Mary. Uh, we're very excited to work with you in the near future. Um, I'm going to do a quick review of this past year and then looking towards the future and a little bit about the financials of, of the organization. Um, just to make sure that we're all grounded, because sometimes people are new to the organization when they come to these meetings, so kind of what do we think of the neighborhood? Um, we are not a, a, an official uh, designated portion of the, of the city. Um, we don't have a BIA like the Downtown Everett Association, and we um, are not a neighborhood association in a strict sense, but um, we define our, our barriers by the proximity to Everett Station uh, and the conversations we've had, so there's the that out, white outline that is not circular that um, shows kind of from Broadway to the, to the freeway and from Hewitt to 41st Street, roughly speaking, as the area that we focused on the most. Um, and then, of course, I'm just thinking about the station, the quarter mile or half mile away from the station itself. Um, in 2021, um, I'm going to go through these program areas, what we've accomplished. Um, for making our neighborhood cleaner and safer, we started uh, um, tracking the crime rates within uh, the neighborhood based off the reports and also initiated report case files from the city. Uh, so we have this dashboard online. Um, there is a general, uh, on both trackers, a general decline over the last five, six years, which is the good news. It's still higher than our documents would like. Um, you will see 2021. Uh, this is monthly data uh, going across, and in 2021, our months were higher than in 2020. So, uh, although there's a general decline, obviously the pandemic has probably changed too. Things are happening in the street. Like that. Um, this year, we also saw the Smith Avenue uh, pilot project be implemented alongside the No Sit No Light ordinance and based off of the clean data that we had through our Smith Avenue safety forum, business owners have been uh, very excited about it. And from the reports from the city and from the Everett Hospital Mission, the project itself has been highly successful in uh, helping people have a stable place to live. And I, we haven't heard yet uh, in terms of whether the city is going to uh, request an expansion of the site and expansion elsewhere, but we do expect that on January 1st. Uh, that the city will uh, add additional units. Um, we started in Dr. Street program, uh, focusing on the Smith Avenue area. Uh, both of our council members elect were volunteers during that process. 
we had more than 40, I uh, believe there's 44 volunteers over three different cleanups. Uh, we're doing them uh, every three months except for the winter uh, basis. Uh, and we collected in totality 101 bags of trash and I don't know how many hypodermic needles, a lot. Um, and it was still uh, not enough. You can see uh, people in the bushes here. We got about two thirds of the bushes done and in the middle is still uh, full of stuff. So there's still a lot of work to be done in the neighborhood and it will be a constant issue. Um, starting in 2019, uh, at the request of property owners, we had done an on-street parking proposal that the city implemented for area uh, west of the tracks. And when we were doing that, we communicated we would expand that proposal to the rest of the neighborhood uh, to make sure that there's uniform for application. We made that um, Jennifer Cowar, AmeriCorps, uh, Vista volunteer um, helped uh, do that plan, submitted to the city, and is still under consideration by other public works in terms of implementation for new parking restrictions that would help the businesses of what they'd like to see. Uh, yep. Don't tail off when you listen. Oh, I find, am I tailing off? Yeah, you're okay. start, starting loud and then you're tailing off. And I'm fearing that people may yep. not be able to hear you. Okay. Oh, I just, <clears throat> I'll punctuate the ends of my system. So um, in the neighborhood, um, there have been, of course, in prior years, some new development like Oakbrook Station 2 um, and uh, the Connect Apartments. So those are the red and green on the map. Um, this, this year, we've seen the opening of the Compass Health uh, Facility um, and two applications moving forward, uh, one, is a bath plus and then the other is still in pre-application uh, process uh, which is kind of the first true trans-oriented development neighborhood as it is closest to the station um, just a block away we created an uh, online neighborhood directory of businesses still uh, a work in progress um, but it is there so we're trying to figure out ways um, to support our businesses even during the pandemic while we're online. Finally, we do a lot of work in preparing for the future. Um, obviously, there are big things happening, and we're going to start a presentation later of the Everett Link extension happening um, that Town Transit is planning, and the city of Everett continues to do uh, planning work around housing and the major update to the comprehensive plan this, uh, starting this coming year. Um, but this past year was the rethink housing strategy that was passed. And so we, we worked on both of those this year in terms of working with agency staff. The biggest thing that we did um, wrapped up in June, uh, which was our convergence at Everett Station study with Housing Hope. Um, and so that created, uh, it, it studied the possibilities for doing equitable development on the city owned properties in the neighborhood of the uh, park and ride lot west of the station and on the senior street properties um, that public works has, as well as ever transit. Um, based off of, we did all of the community engagement on that front of hundreds of, of stakeholders involved. Um, it resulted in five key steps for implementation. Um, and I'm just going to kind of list them now because they're going to be important for our 2022 work. Uh, one, support existing local light industrial businesses and promote a green uh, economy and employment. Develop neighborhood specific equitable development plans for specific things around uh, the public realm of placemaking, uh, mobility and access to the station, neighborhood business collaboratives. Um, we have more on that to talk about a governance model for how to make sure that uh, there's serv the services have a model to, and the space has a model for being administered. And then finally, project funding and how do we fund this transformation of the place. Three, uh, really focusing on that west site, the uh, park and ride lot. Um, and there's some near term actions to make that a, a reality that need to be made, including an FTA waiver. Um, from the Federal Transit Administration. Uh, four, implement a loop of, of uh, key public realm improvements. 
So this would be uh, a way that people can walk and bike around and, and have stormwater infrastructure call uh, to, to be able to just be a, a, a connected neighborhood that connects across the tracks. And then finally, um, having a public-private partnership development for the Public Works Cedar Street campus, having a, a key strategy for how that's going to happen. Um, so that was our kind of our 2021 activities. Uh, our board passed five key resolutions uh, that relate to all those things I just said. First was uh, supporting the pallet shelter project in the Nose and the Life Ordinance when it's going through council. Uh, creating a Smith Avenue Safety Forum uh, and Smith Avenue Committee. Um, authorizing the, uh, the board treasurer to be uh, a our bank signatory. So it's the basic operations that we passed the resolution for. Endorsing the convergence study, um, including uh, incorporated into it, we have now uh, uh, equity principles uh, and statements uh, on racial injustice in it. Um, and finally, recommending the 2022 to 2024 board site, which we'll vote on shortly. Looking to 2022 uh, by program area, um, we're going to continue the adopt the street program for within the community safe, uh, safe program. Uh, obviously, that's just three times a year at this point, but uh, so we're going to need to do something more eventually. Um, we're going to continue the Smith Avenue safety forum so property owners have a place to come to and discuss issues that are related to Smith Avenue. Um, continue to implement and work with the city on implementing the parking plan. Um, and then starting a conversation about uh, creating a business improvement area. And that's the last thing on our agenda for 30 minutes. So I'll talk about it then. Um, neighborhood <coughs> enhancement. Uh, we have an exciting grant uh, for doing murals in the neighborhood. Um, preparing for the future. Uh, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but uh, implementing the convergence at station study. Um, there's the station to arena project, uh, the Everett Link extension EIS, and the city begins its major update to its comprehensive plan. So those are some of the big highlights that we're excited about in 2022. And just to drill down on, on three of them, um, in 2019, we successfully uh, helped the city get a grant of $1.9 million for improving the walking and biking experience between Everett Station and the arena. Um, and the city is the last one to get its money uh, in line for this with, with Sound Transit, where they got the money from. Um, and to start this project, but it's supposed to kick off this next year, the design work. And so we're really excited about these improvements that happen, which need to be constructed at least by 2024. So it's happening to it quickly here. Um, and then exciting mural projects. So um, along that route is the Pacific Avenue overpass. It goes over Smith Avenue. And we're excited about being able the underside and the pillars, um, as well as uh, three murals in the neighborhood. Um, if you are a business owner with the building in the neighborhood, we're still looking for two buildings to put murals on. And so we'll be doing a call for requests that if, if a business would like to have that mural, a, a mural on their wall. So. Finally, um, what is probably the, the most exciting thing is with the support of Kaiser Permanente, we're able to launch in a really deep way the implementation, the beginning of the implementation of the conversion study. And so we will be building a community collaborative um, that brings the key leaders within our city and communities uh, together um, around a strategic plan for implementing that study. Um, and so it's going to have a leadership advisory council um, of 15 to 21 individuals um, informed by an equity committee. We had an equity committee as part of the, the study. And so that will be an evolution of that project um, or of the study. And then under that, we have uh, a few work groups for big things that we hope, and hope to happen over the next three to five years that are gonna kick that off. So the first is a social service nonprofit work group that will establish a collaborative um, so we have eight plus nonprofits in this neighborhood, um, and there's a great opportunity to align their missions and their program work to providing services here in the neighborhood of thinking about um, when there's 10 or 20,000 more people in the neighborhood, 
um, how are they getting those services. Um, the next is a workforce development work group. Um, our neighborhood has you know, several key industries, but probably the two biggest is healthcare with Kaiser Permanente, Compass Health, and with, um, uh, we have kind of a private medical center uh, with Concentra uh, on the south end of the neighborhood along Broadway. And so there's a great opportunity to work with WSU Everett and Everett Community College uh, to really build a workforce development program like that. Then the other is just construction trades. Uh, we have windows and doors manufacturers, uh, cabinetry makers, and there's an opportunity there to help uh, people in both cases lift them out of poverty and into jobs uh, that are connected to this neighborhood. So we're really excited about that. And then finally, um, there's all these bigger picture things like Sound Transit 3's Everlink extension, the major update to our comprehensive plan, um, being able to plan out the development of the West Park and Ray lot. Um, uh, the Cedar Street properties. Um, that built environment uh, work will require some thought from uh, community members of, as well as a lot of staff time. And so uh, we will house work groups around housing and our mobility streetscapes committee. So Kristen will be tapping back and, and fall to, to come back with the streetscape and mobility committee. Um, so this is very exciting. We're excited to launch it. Um, we're just gonna get this off the ground and then over the next three to five years, start to implement the convergence study um, through these collaborative that are set up. Looking at our organization's um, budget from 2021. Um, so on the left is revenue, right is expenses. Uh, we, I've been uh, at part time for this, this year with the ESDA. So our payroll is um, less than previous years um, and supported by grants, uh, the PPP, and sponsorships and donations on a pretty equal basis. Let's leave this here for a second. Yeah. Um, we will, the board will be finalizing, you know, approving the final uh, financials in January once we have them all completed. Um, our 2022 budget, which will be adopted next week by the board, um, so this is just preliminary at this point. This is maybe a little confusing at first of the pie charts. Uh, I'll take a second. Um, we do imagine at some point that we will have a business improvement area supporting the organization. We don't know how much that'll be, that is or, or when that will happen, so we don't have an estimated budget for that. So uh, that's the white slice there. We have, it's just indicating that exists. Uh, the only thing that really matters for, for a budget, though, at this point is the things that we know. And so those are the colored portions of, uh, on the revenue side, grants, membership, and sponsorships. Um, then on the expenses are operating costs, uh, payroll, and professional services, um, which uh, includes like paying the artists for murals and, and all things like that. So um, our current uh, expected budget, just uh, based off of that revenue, is $160,000. Um, and uh, to a large extent, it's supported through uh, our, our grants that we were able to secure the city of Everett and Kaiser for um, The other thing is it, in previous years, membership has been a smaller number because we categorized our public agency contributions as sponsorships. And in a moment, we will be uh, considering flipping how we categorize that. That, I don't, let's see here. I need to be done at 12.35, so what time is it? 12.36. Okay, so um, I'm sure you have some questions, but I think uh, we can maybe wait towards uh, the end of the meeting and you can you can fit in the BIA uh, questions into the broader questions for the Like that, I think I'm handing it over to Ed. So we're, this is the fifth annual meeting of this organization. And uh, as Brock described the last year, um, a lot's happened. And we're growing into opportunities for initiatives that improve the quality of this neighborhood. And I want to emphasize that uh, this is a unique neighborhood that's been industrial in nature for a long time. 
and continues to be a key economic center for our state. So it's very important in the work that we do that we uh, find and look for ways to support the economic vitality of the neighborhood. And uh, we are, uh, for example, in the convergence study, uh, have recommended a study of the rate of the freight corridors in the community, because as residential and other business and other activities uh, grow in the neighborhood, it's important that the uh, industry that exists here have access to their buildings uh, for bringing in materials and access uh, to market, send, send products to market. So that's a very high uh, important item that you will see in many of the documents that have been created by the organization. Likewise, creating bicycle corridors and supporting the uh, vitality of the neighborhood, the streetscape and, and uh, user-friendly bike corridors is another common theme and important agenda that is integrated with the transit system the, and the uh, first and last mile issue that uh, those with public transportation. Um, in addition, residential uh, was integrated into the Metro Everett uh, plan for the city of Everett in 2018. Here we are three years later. Uh, we continue to look at uh, ways uh, to support the development of residential uh, in this neighborhood as a part of a solution for our city and the issues of affordable housing market rate housing, all kinds of housing. And uh, we uh, have seen the first residential development in 2019 at Hopeford, second one in 2020 at Connect to the Broadway apartment, third one in 2021 at Compass Health with uh, mental health housing. A fourth one is in the works uh, at a property that would add 165 more units, bringing us up to close to 500 housing units. Uh, and that's all since 2000, uh, November of 2019. So two years, there is a movement on uh, bringing residential into the neighborhood and the equation between industry and residential is a very important variable that needs to be carefully designed and developed. So that's an important uh, uh, agenda for this neighborhood that uh, goes with all the work that uh, the building blocks that have been created. We've looked at our membership uh, structure and our um, uh, sponsorship structure and have uh, the board of directors has recommended for the membership to adopt today. Uh, so we have two business items in the middle of this, uh, a lot of presentations and background information. Um, and the two uh, items, the first one is uh, ESDA membership fee structure. So we want to continue the fifth $25 to incentivize anybody that wants to be a part of this initiative to join the organization uh, and be on the mailing list and be on the invitation list for all the uh, meetings that are occurring, uh, workshops and sessions and information about sound transit and, and, and all of the initiatives happening. Uh, but in addition, we would encourage our supporters to support the organization financially. So we have a nonprofit uh, and corporate uh, sponsorship level of $100. Uh, public utilities, county, regional governments are being asked to contribute at the $500 level. Several of our transit agencies uh, have been supporting us for years, and uh, that uh, starts at the $2,500 level. Uh, City of Everett has uh, this year uh, contributed um, $7,500 to support the work of this organization. Uh, we've set that at a, at a minimum at $5,000 for uh, as a proposed amount for the future, a minimum amount and uh, uh, regional transit agencies uh, which is essentially sound transit uh, is uh, at the $7,500 level, which they have been providing this level of support for quite a few years now. So this is a proposal for action. Anybody who is a member that showed up on that membership list that we showed you earlier, 
is uh, eligible to vote at this meeting at our two meetings every year so my annual meeting in june and the annual meeting in december and so um i would like somebody that is a member to make a motion to approve this proposal we'll get a second and then we'll have discussion so can i have somebody put this on the floor with motion moved a second okay. moved and seconded to approve this new uh, esd membership fee structure policy any discussion or questions Uh, anybody if, if nobody has questions, uh, if, if somebody has questions online, feel free to put it in the chat or, uh, or ask it. I, we haven't tested audio yet from uh, from out in the ether, so if you get to do that at some point, we're about to have some presenters. Um, that I just want to provide maybe just two things where which we're trying to help resolve uh, through this process. One, um, Ben who's here from PSRC might appreciate this. Um, PSRC indicated that they would be able to donate to the organization, but not as a sponsorship, that they needed a membership uh, type structure for that to work. Um, uh, I'm not sure, we've had some discussions with the PUD. I don't think it really matters whether it's a sponsorship or, or membership for them, but uh, at least everybody gets categorized the same way this way, that all public agencies are treated this way. Public agencies don't get a tax write-off by donating, so it's fundamentally different than a private donation from a company or from somebody else. So um, it just they don't need to be categorized as sponsorships. The other is um, oftentimes we've had individuals who have, their companies have given the, or their nonprofits have paid the dues, um, and sometimes there's a changeover in who from the company is rep, uh, being represented. And so this will help establish a process by which if a company has paid for an individual's dues that they don't pay, have to pay another $25 or keep doing that throughout the year. If there's just a flat $100 and they can designate the representative of this at whatever meeting it is. Um, so it just helps uh, provide a way to clarify that we have any questions online? Anybody want to raise their hand? Uh, Brock monitoring the online. We uh, have one person. Can it's uh, me. Can you hear me? Yeah, and loud and clear. Loud and clear. This is great. You can hear. I can hear you better than we can hear myself. In this Fantastic. I was. I figured I would ask a question and be the guinea pig here for the online folks. Uh, has anyone, any of our local partners on this uh, suggested they want anything else with the structure? I mean, from Suntrans' point of view, this is a good structure for us. I'll point out to, to members where your organizations uh, have the sponsorship here. Um, I pay uh, the $25 myself just because I believe in this and would recommend that others do that themselves if they can. Um, and that's all I have to say. Just wanted to know if anyone else uh, outside of this meeting had weighed in on this yet. That was Eric from Sound Transit. Um, and uh, I don't think there is anybody else that has brought up issues or questions. Yeah, um, Roland is not here yet, I think, but um, he he, online? he's online. He's online. He, and I mean, Roland can speak for himself, but indicated our last board meeting, it didn't matter whether it was a sponsorship or membership structure. Um, and then just to clarify, um, uh, it, the city of Everett kind of gets hit twice on this chart um, because it's Everett Transit plus the city of Everett. So that matches their donation of this year. Uh, but they could choose in future years to just do one of those two or you know, do a different approach. Any other discussion? in favor uh, who are members of this organization say aye. 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 Anybody? Aye. 
Senate is like one uh, no vote and the remaining are all in favor. So can I, can I clarify? I think I heard that was Chuck's voice and I think Chuck, you were just delayed on the, uh, on the unmute button. And that was a yes vote, not a no vote. <laughs> That was a yes vote for Chuck. Thank you, Chuck. Unanimous. Okay, by unanimous vote, we have a new uh, membership key structure. Thank you all very much. The other item for the agenda today is the election of board members. We are <clears throat> operating on three year uh, board terms. Uh, there are eight people that are willing to serve and have been reviewed by our nominating committee and are recommended as board members beginning January 1, 2022 for three years. Um, on this list are three new people who have not been a part of the organization and five who have been serving and whose terms are now up and uh, ready for and willing to uh, enter into new three-year terms. So the new uh, proposed members include Sylvia Anderson, who is the executive director of the Ever Gospel Mission. Uh, Sylvia has been the CEO for this organization for 20 years in the neighborhood. It's an important uh, uh, organization in a lot of ways, and uh, having her voice on the board of directors will be beneficial to uh, the organization and the dialogue and discussion that we have. Uh, the third bullet down is Danielle Calvoto, who uh, joined our community in August of this past year as the general manager of the Delta Marriott Hotel. And Danielle comes from uh, a long, I think, 20 year history uh, with, with the uh, uh, um, Hollander uh, organization, which has hotels throughout the uh, state of Washington and Oregon, I think Portland. Uh, uh, Danielle has uh, had deep experience in uh, Tacoma. And uh, one of the valuable things with Danielle, it, her background is that she's worked with business improvement associations uh, extensively in this. Uh, throughout the Hollander system, which is Bellingham, <laughs> Seattle, Tacoma, Portland. Um, and then the third person is Lori Fox. And Lori is a property owner in the neighborhood. She owns a uh, uh, organization called ML Architectural Woodwork. ML, ML Fox Architectural Woodwork. ML Fox Architectural Woodwork uh, make cabinets and other kinds of um, furniture. Uh, and uh, has been active in the organization uh, over the last several years, and in particular on the Smith Avenue Safety Forum. So those three, in addition to Roland BT, who is with Community Transit, has been on the board up until now. Uh, Molly Faye Cruz at United Way. I cabinets in the neighborhood, Joe Seavers owns uh, Seifert. Uh, uh, so um, the nominating committee has made a recommendation uh, and the board is further recommended uh, your approval today of this slate of board members. And we have a motion to put this on the floor. This is Jennifer Cross. I'll make a motion. It's moved and seconded. You need the names of who? Jennifer Cross moved and Chuck seconded. Okay. Yeah. So it's been moved, seconded. Any discussion? Brenda. Uh, Brenda White, since you have a PD, I might just uh, clarify this is, this is uh, for your terms. Uh, some being renewed, some new, this is eight members of a 15 member board, seven board members uh, are continuing their terms to end in either 2020, end of 2022 or 2023. And these would be going till 2024. All right, no 
further discussion, all those in favor uh, of this slate of board members say aye. 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 Let's wait a little bit just so that we don't get a straggler in there. That sounds like a no. Uh, any opposed? By unanimous vote of the uh, organization, this slate of board members is approved. All right, we are now moving forward with a uh, presentation. Brock, do you want to do the introduction on this? Sure. Uh, so we're excited to, for, to be into our transit updates. There's some major things happening with all three transit agencies. Um, Roland, I'm going to stop my sharing my screen and you should be able to start sharing your screen. Um, Roland B. E. is a board member with ESDA and um, the head planner at Community Transit. Uh, I'm sure Rowan would, will correct me in terms of his proper title. Um, also, uh, Tom Hinkson is with us, also formerly of the board, uh, director of Epic Transit. Um, and Rowan will be covering both the, the major updates with, that are coming for 2024. She'll explain that. Um, some electric vehicle uh, study work that, he, that is happening, as well as a framework that was just adopted by the Community Transit Board and by the, the Everett City Council for having a discussion about a potential merger of Everett Transit and Community Transit. And so Tom is here for Q&A on that portion as well. So with that, Roland, um, feel free to take it away. And I think we can see you on the screen here. So, yep. Thank you, Brock. Uh, yeah, Roland Behe, um, Director of Planning and Development for Community Transit. Um, I'm just going to pause for 10 seconds and say um, I've really been pleased to be uh, associated with ESDA um, and was excited to, you know, to hear the early comments in the meeting about changes, um, um, you know, that are exciting for the city relating to the district. I'm a lifelong Everett resident and also um, a, uh, a frequent user of the station as both a biker and a bus rider. So um, it's uh, this role is a, is an easy one for me in terms of representing community transit, but also having a real close association with the work that we're about and uh, strong supporter for it. So pleased to be here. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, uh, want to move through uh, the presentation here. Um, the uh, I, I think a, a good way to summarize what I'm going to talk about is. Uh, so much of what we are about in our work in the Everett Station District is about the, um, realizing the ultimate um, neighborhood potential for this area as both a, a critical neighborhood in the city, a focus of business, a focus of residential, but also transit. And a lot of that is, is so um, focused on the future with the arrival of light rail in Everett. And what I'm going to talk about for just a few minutes is what's going on to the south as a, um, as a preview of coming attractions. Uh, Community Transit just connected with light rail at Northgate back in October. Um, I'll talk briefly about that. We are in the closing phases of planning for connecting to light rail in Linwood uh, and Mount Lake Harrison shoreline in 2024, which has often sounded like it's a long ways away, but now it is just around the corner in planning terms. And so a lot of the lessons that we are learning um, and the opportunities we're seeing for improvements in public transit uh, can be applied forward into the Everett Lake Extension process into, into the future of what we see around Everett Station. So that's kind of the spirit I'll, I'll offer the presentation in. Lots of opportunity for um, uh, improved mobility and a lot of transition underway right now in transit. Um, so briefly, we connected with, uh, with Link Light Rail at Northgate um, back at the beginning of October. We're a couple of months into that connection now. Um, this has been uh, with Community Transit's um, historic services that, that have traditionally served the University of Washington. And then Sound Transit um, was a partner with us in this, um, obviously providing the light rail itself, but also the ST Express commuter bus services, which Community Transit operates. And um, a significant portion of those services were, all, were also redirected toward a connection at Northgate. And so we're learning a lot in that experience about what it takes to provide an effective intermodal connection between bus and light rail. Um, we're seeing um, encouraging utilization of that connection 
And we're also seeing how customer behavior changes when they're presented with options. So people that are, um, that are using this connection every day and other customers who are, um, who are adapting and, and doing something different, for example, continuing to, uh, to take the buses that we, um, that we operate to downtown Seattle and, and bypassing light rail. And they're making both of those choices and some of them are making those choices on a daily basis where they may take light rail in one direction and a bus in the other direction. So it's interesting, we're monitoring those patterns and, um, and really working closely to help understand that so we can, um, we can be positioned uh, to, to take advantage of the connection at Linwood when that comes online in 2024. The, the, the 2024 opportunity is really when light rail gets to Snohomish County, we'll be looking at um, uh, the ability to restructure virtually the entire network at community transit around this new opportunity. So for many years, a, about a third of what community transit has done in, um, in transit has been long haul commuter service from park and rides in Snohomish County to either the University of Washington or downtown Seattle. When light rail comes to Linwood and Mount Lake Terrace and Shoreline, um, we will redirect all of those services into Snohomish County so that they both will uh, provide uh, ongoing express connections from communities around the county to those light rail uh, station locations, but also into um, a much more robust level of arterial and neighborhood service throughout the county as well. And so it really presents this, um, this unprecedented opportunity um, to remake what community transit does in Snohomish County and as a result of the major public investment in light rail, um, allow the bus system to do so much more, uh, both in complement, complement to that light rail service, um, but also in, in other areas of the county that aren't close to light rail. So it's really a huge opportunity for us. And we've been underway with the first phase um, of public outreach uh, in gathering information about that new network for the past couple of months. And I'm not gonna provide a high level, of, a lot of detail on this, but I wanna highlight kind of two key features. Um, one of the things that we're really focusing on is increased frequency of service, particularly in an expanded SWIFT BRT network. And this is our, our long range plan showing the, the blue and the green lines that we've been operating for some time, the orange line in the south, which will be our first really east-west corridor um, connecting directly to light rail at Linwood Transit Center. And then, um, and then you can see looking a little further afield into the 2027 timeframe, another line coming into Everett Station that will be focused on North County, um, going out North Broadway and upstate through Marysville and Arlington, serving the Cascade Industrial Center and, and terminating probably at Smoky Point Transit Center. So, um, so part of the plan is based on frequent arterial service and an expanded BRT network. Another part of the plan is focused on new service options. And one of the things that we've really seen in over the, the past two years as we've been in the pandemic, um, it has really helped to sharpen the focus that transit ridership is changing. Some of that's being driven by, um, by new options that are available like telecommute, and we're seeing you know, big changes in the commuter market. Um, but other changes have been, have been underway for a while, and it's about how people gather information about transit using their, their mobile phones primarily and a different expectation for um, the level of service on demand. And what we've seen across the industry is a real um, renaissance and movement toward uh, micro transit and other on-demand transit opportunities that can allow people to get much closer to the service and not rely solely on, um, on major transit trunk lines to provide mobility. So wanted to really um, emphasize that, that uh, one of the things we're seeing as we as we look at the return of ridership post pandemic and moving forward um, as we make this connection to light rail is um, we're going to have to get much more proactive about going out and actually bringing riders into the system rather than um, uh, traditionally relying on them to find us and micro transit is one of those strategies we have a pilot project that we're beginning in linwood next year um, to begin experimenting with this, to learn lessons, and then to replicate that model across our service areas. So um, that's a significant part of our, of our future planning um, along with the light rail connection. In terms of this 2024 network development process, this just helps to highlight the overall um, arc of the work. We've had um, a significant amount of planning over the past couple of years to help us prepare for this. We're now in the closing phases of our phase one outreach um, and there uh, a little bit later, we'll share a link that shows the, 
online open house that remains open on community transits website through the 17th of this month we've um, in the closing in I've given 1000 participants so far in terms of people that have taken surveys and provided us with feedback on this first phase of outreach. That will be followed next year by a second phase of outreach where we present more detailed network plans and we're looking to engage communities across our service area and um, groups like ESDA and other partners that we've been meeting with. And the project will be completed um, at the end of next year when we put the final draft network um, uh, out for final public review and then our board has the opportunity to make a, um, a final decision point adopting that. And then in 2023 and into early 2024, we will be implementing as light rail comes online. This provides a, a link to the uh, to the survey on community transits website and I'll um, I'll be happy to share these slides uh, and uh, perhaps Brock we can provide the link in the in the chat at some point or make it make it easy for people to uh, to find that um, but would encourage anybody who's interested to provide feedback in this process before the 17th um, we're uh, we're really excited to uh, at the level of engagement that we've had so far uh, before i stop i want to talk um, as, as brock outlined in addition to this 2024 network um, study that we have underway Two other major efforts that are underway. Um, one is a zero emission bus study. And um, I wanted to uh, just um, note that community transit for a number of, his year, of years has been a, in a place of what we've called watchful waiting on the state of the technology for electric or zero emission vehicles. And um, as, we, as we moved through this year, this was the time to begin our uh, more intentional study of feasibility of that for community transit. And so we're underway with that study and have contracted with WSP to, um, to help us with that work. One thing that we're learning with um, electric buses is, uh, and with this technology, the, the industry guidance is that you really need to do the due diligence for, um, for your own agency. Um, and community transit has a, a unique service geography and a, um, a, some unique needs in terms of the length of some of our routes and what we would call the um, the, the, the duty cycle or the, the turnaround time for vehicles. And that's helping to influence um, the nature of the technology that we would select for our buses. So we're doing a, um, we wanna um, explore different propulsion technologies. We're looking at battery electric bus, we're looking at, um, at hydrogen propulsion and whatever else the market will offer. And we'll be evaluating those and then determining what's the best fit or perhaps multiple technologies that the agency would move forward this forward with as we, um, as we look at transitioning our fleet to uh, zero emission um, in the coming year. So at the end of the study, we're anticipating this will be a 12 to 18 month effort. We will be um, looking at recommendations for our board to adopt in terms of the timing and the specific technology selection, the types of vehicles, and also the capital projects that would be required to implement um, uh, electric or other propulsion for our fleet. So that was one, um, piece we wanted to share. The other is long-range planning. Um, community transit is updating the long-range plan that we first adopted back in 2011 and we're pushing the horizon out to the new 2050 um, regional planning horizon. That project has also kicked off this year and we'll start to see some public outreach associated with that in the first quarter of next year as we begin to reimagine what community transit looks like in the future. And both of the efforts that I've talked about in terms of the 2024 network planning and our zero emission study will be foundational to the ultimate long range plan that we adopt um, as that project is completed in 2023. So there's a, a lot of forward planning going on at community transit right now. And the, the transition that we're seeing around um, first at Northgate and now um, uh, on the immediate horizon when Linwood Link comes to Snohomish County those will be um, really transformational as we look at the next 20 to 30 years of, of community transit. So um, lots going on. Uh, I wanna to transition to the topic that Tom and I are gonna talk about next. And as we think about 2024 network planning, uh, different propulsion technologies for community transit and zero emission vehicles and a new long range plan. One thing that is really um, uh, more and more um, playing into those discussions and a, um, a consideration that we're making as we talk about those, those future endeavors is what would they look like 
under a scenario where Everett Transit and Community Transit have joined and are consolidated. And that's a, um, it's something that we're, uh, we're excited about, um, about that work. We're excited to be partnering with the city of Everett to consider um, what an integrated system could look like. And um, it's beginning to really, uh, to, uh, to be another background consideration that is, uh, that's an element of all the work that I have described. So with that, um, I think uh, I'm gonna hand the screen back, Brock, to you. And Tom and I will uh, will talk for a bit about the, uh, the work that we have underway as of last week with uh, between Everett Transit and Community Transit. And Tom, I might just, maybe I'll start out with just a brief introduction on this that, uh, um, we're really excited to be partnering with, uh, with the city. Um, uh, we've been in a supporting role with, uh, with the city of Everett as they've um, gone through their rethink transit process over, the, over a number of years recently, between 2018, I think, and, um, and this year. And earlier this year, as that, uh, as that report was finalized and, and went to council, um, Community Transit was asked to, um, to continue participating in the process with the city and to partner on a study to determine um, what could a consolidated agency, what could a consolidated agency look like and what would be the value proposition that we could bring to the table together um, in an integrated transit system. And so uh, our boards, uh, Community Transit's board and Everett Council last week uh, took action um, uh, both uh, both to approve that next step in the process, which was to study that question and, uh, and move forward so that we could in the future um, inform potential council action to move forward with that, um, should that be the city's decision. So um, excited to be participating in that um, um, opportunity to, um, to really explore all the potentials in terms of greater mobility for the, uh, for the community at large and um, lots of opportunity uh, for an improved transit system. So, uh, Tom, I'll stop talking at that point and maybe let you add um, add whatever whatever else I haven't haven't talked about on the Everett. Well, I think you covered it really well, Roland, and thank you. Uh, one thing that we really came to understand through our rethink transit is that there was a question of sustainability, long term sustainability for the level of service that we believe. Everett will need and deserves by the time light rail gets to Everett, whether it's 2037 or 2041. Uh, we have financial capacity at nine tenths of 1% at Everett Transit. That's our legal authority. And my task during all of the things that Roland was talking about will also be to be updating Everett's long range plan. And uh, many of the things that Roland talked about. Uh, the uh, potential of micro transit as a way to mitigate and improve service in hard to serve communities. Uh, those kinds of things will fit into our thinking as well. So as we are looking at uh, a potential consolidation or the question is how far will nine tenths take us? Because that's part of the question that council has also given me is show us how far we can go. Uh, that kind of came out of the conversation last week. So we're committed to both of those processes. And then uh, ultimately it will be the council's decision on the direction they want to go. And, and again, we remind everybody, it's ultimately the voters decision what they want to do. And we recognize that uh, either a nine tenth sales tax increase or a six tenth sales tax increase, uh, they are both very big questions for our voters eventually that they will have to address. And we want to be thoughtful about it. One thing that uh, I would share that most of you know, Everett Transit is very invested in electric buses. We did our homework a few years back, just as community transit is needing to do now. Uh, and, and I don't want people to think that because Everett Transit has electric buses, why didn't CT do it yet? There's lots of reasons for that. And I think Roland pointed out some of those is that we're just a completely different geographic uh, space. You know, we're 32 square miles. We don't have 
any routes that are longer than about 10 miles in one direction. There's a lot of things uh, that made it a lot of made a lot of sense for Everett to invest in buses early. And on that note, uh, we have nine buses now in operation, and we will be taking delivery of nine more at the end of next year and into the beginning of 2023. And uh, they will have this technology called inductive charging, which simply will allow us to keep the bus in service out in the field all day long, instead of having to bring it back in the middle of the day for a, a charge up before it sends back out. So we're excited about that. Uh, we will be adding charging stations throughout the city. It's going to improve our operational capabilities. And I think it's gonna be a game changer for us. So that's, uh, that's what's happening in Everett. And the other thing, uh, just kind of just not related to this, but we are making some improvements around the station area. If nothing else, the coffee shop is open again. <laughs> people are now, it opened just before Thanksgiving and people are now enjoying access to hot beverages and fresh uh, homemade baked goods right there at the station. So I encourage you all to drop by. So that's it. Time for one, one question. We're a little over. Uh, Joe? Yeah, I'll take the question. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, I can, okay, what is the time frame for these negotiations between Ever Transit and Community Transit? And if I could have you know, a second a follow up, it would be is, would it be possible just to have Ever Transit become a division of Community Transit and all of that? And I'll stop there as we get this meeting on the road because I got to go in five minutes. Well, I think that uh, part of the study is to talk about all the different ways we might achieve a common goal. And so we won't uh, close any doors on that. But in terms of time frame, we're starting in earnest in January. Uh, our schedule has us operating, you know, study process uh, for about uh, 12 to 18 months, certainly more than 12, but maybe less than 18. And uh, and if you could add anything to that, Roland, go ahead. No, I think that's, yeah, it's a, we've identified a, a 12 to 18 month study. And just to reinforce what Tom said, after that study is complete, um, it's really due diligence that then uh, council can take and, and move forward with um, at that point for a potential decision. So we, we really wanted to make it clear that the, the is about exploring the opportunities and then that will be followed by a decision process and ultimately it would be a voter decision should the ballot measure move forward at that point but what Tom and I will be collaborating on over the next year to year and a half is really all of the um, the due diligence in terms of the integration planning so that we can illustrate what that could look like sounds good thank you so much Roland and Tom uh, very helpful and informative, and I think a lot. Looks like somebody else might have a question. Can I just ask one? Question? Yeah, Chris. Uh, Chris McKinnon, uh, Roland in, in particular. I'm really curious, given the, the, the change, the savings that you can have from commuting, from the commuter bus changes and linking up with light rail and sound transit in Sonoma County, and potential savings and benefits of integrating with network transit. Well, uh, I'm curious why a sales tax reduction on the part of community transit is not part of the study. That would also make merging with ever transit more palatable to the voters. I think uh, that's for you, Roland. Yeah, I think so. I think if, if I heard the question, Kristen, the, the sure. question is is there a change in revenue that is a part of the, the process? Um, uh, as we're considering the the what I'm going to call the mobility dividend from connecting to light rail, um, not at this point. We're if you look at Community Transit's latest plan, we're talking about a very substantial service expansion in addition to the connection that we'll be making with light rail, and so that's part of what we're you know part of what we're looking at is the opportunity to provide a much higher level of service throughout the entire community. Um, and to be able to, um, to apply that forward into new services like microtransit and other, other new forms of mobility. So 
uh, it's a, um, I think it's an interesting question. Um, but as we as we get closer to uh, to finishing the 2024 network work, and then also updating our long range plan, um, a part of that is also going to be updating our financial forecast. So at this point, that's um, that's not a uh, not a conclusion we've come to, but you'll see as we uh, as we complete the study work, uh, the higher level of service is really what we're uh, what we're planning for. Thank you again, Roland and Tom. Um, you, maybe there'll be some questions after Eric presents about sound transit, uh, but I will take the pins off and allow uh, us to go to. And Eric, do you want me to do your uh, go through your presentation for you? If you could, that would be, would be great. I've been having internet issues all day and maybe this will alleviate it. So I know we're really short on time, Brock, so I will do my best to get through this so we have time for questions because I think that's the most important thing. Uh, once again, everyone, my name is Eric Ashley Vinka. I'm the Government and Community Relations Manager for the North Corridor for Sound Transit. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Primarily what I'm going to talk about today is Everett Link extension, but I do want to just give a quick overview uh, and talk a little bit about current construction. Um, so we'll go into that first and then get into the, the depths of Everett Link. Next slide. So I'd like to show this to everyone. I know this group is pretty familiar with us, but I like to show the Regional Transit Authority who we are, Sound Transit, and what this map entails. As you can see from the map, it's the three major urban areas. Uh, counties including King, Pierce, and Snohomish. We serve 52 cities, have over 1,000 square miles that we serve. And as you can see, about over just over 3 million in this uh, regional transit authority. That's about 40% of our population. Next slide. Uh, currently, this is our system expansion plan with three modes of service. Light rail, we're all familiar with. Sounder, this group is really familiar with as far as the commuter rail and uh, bus rapid transit coming online in the next few years. Uh, next slide, and into current construction. Let's talk about what's going on. This is a slide I like to share every time because over the next two years, I've been saying three or four, but it's already two. Um, we're gonna have 28 stations, including what just opened with Northgate, the three in October, 28 stations over the course of the next two years opening throughout the region. And so this is a transformative moment for us. Uh, overnight, you'll see East Link open up and 10 stations open up out to the east side. Uh, for those of us that are really excited about what's happening with Linwood, we're just two years away from that. And we'll talk a little bit about that more after we get into this next slide. I just want to take a second, next slide, to talk about Northgate. So we did open on October 2nd, if I remember the date right. Um, this is a big deal for us because this is really the first connection to Snohomish County. And for a lot of us, uh, this Northgate link has always been a hub for us to get into Seattle, whether it be through bus or something else, and especially going to those Seahawks games, Husky games. But now we're getting into Snohomish County with this, so we're really excited about that. It's been a lot of work, a long time coming, and so we're just super excited to have this station open now. Next slide. So let's, I just want to talk a little bit about Linwood Lake Extension because it's right there uh, on the, just the tip of being finished here in the next couple of years. But as you can see, it's going to be four stations from Shoreline South all the way up to Linwood Transit Center or City Center. And the two in between at Mount Lake Terrace Transit Center and the 185th station. Um, this is eight and a half miles, as you can see. And we're planning on opening in 2024 in the summer. Uh, next slide. So this is just our baseline schedule. I like to show people where this process started back in 2010 with uh, planning and environmental work and then where we're at today. As you can see here, we're, we're over 50% of construction at this point now on the project. And so pretty much as you'll see in these next couple of slides, we've built this system out. So it looks like a, an actual light rail finally. And so as you can see here, we're gonna open the parking garage uh, next year, possibly into that January 2023 20, timeframe, but then in summer of 24, this project will be open. Next slide. So there's two major sections of Linwood Link. Um, as you can see here, this is what we call L200. That's North Gateway right up to Northeast 200th Street. 56% uh, complete as of earlier this month. 
Um, and the pictures here, you can see one of the parking garages really where we've been laying concrete for the garages. Um, if you look at the top right, and it's not a very big picture, so it's hard to see, but this is where we're first uh, laying some of that track and the, the rails. So it's really exciting to actually see that in person. Uh, next slide. And then L300 goes from 200 uh, all the way up to the Linwood Transit Center. Uh, we had an opportunity to take out the city uh, of Mount Lake Terrace and Congressman Larson a few weeks ago to the Mount Lake Terrace station. And so it was really exciting to show those the rails, which I don't have on this picture, but I mentioned in the last, um, to actually see the progress happening. I mean, at this point, you can walk from Linwood Transit Center all the way down to really shoreline on the tracks now because that whole entire, it's all built. And so that's really exciting to see. But as we start to have something that looks like a, a finished product, I remind people that you aren't, aren't going to see trains yet because we've got to build out the electrical system, all that internal stuff that you don't see. People see a, a track go up and they essentially think, where's the trains? Um, so let's go into the next slide. Um, before I get into Everett Link Extension, I know I've got, I think, probably seven minutes to keep Brock on time here. Are there any questions just about the sound transit, just overview stuff or Linwood Link specifically? And I'll wait for a second. I don't see any hands. So just throw your hand up if you do have a question throughout. So Everett Link Extension is uh, finally kicked off. Super excited about this. Uh, we've had this realignment process, which I'll talk about a little bit, but Essentially, Everett Lake Extension is now uh, full swing in terms of where we're at in alternatives development, which I'll talk about a little bit. But at 16 miles, this is the longest stretch of light rail that we have in the system to date or planned. And so it's twice as long almost as what we have in Linwood Link. So oftentimes when you see a project this big uh, across the US, this would be broken up into several sections. But I think that the, what the community wanted, they wanted to see this done as soon as possible. And I continue to hear that in, in the public, in everything that we uh, do in terms of our engagement efforts. Uh, it's going to have six plus one provisional station. So what I mean when I say that is this uh, 99 and airport road that's grayed out right there, kind of where it curves off into the west. Uh, that's a provisional station that isn't funded, but the other stations are. So planning on the six with hopes to come back to the airport road station. Uh, we will continue to plan through this initial first step. Uh, next slide. So uh, before we talk about the dates and everything, Operation and Maintenance Facility North is one of four of the maintenance facilities in this uh, system. And essentially is needed, as you can see, to store, maintain, and repair our trains. Um, this creates typically there's 450 to 500 jobs at these sites. What I like to point out about this is even though it's large in size, usually 60 to 70 acres, uh, they're a lot cleaner and a lot quieter than what you might think of with a maintenance yard. Um, so as we get into this project, uh, we've started talking about jurisdictions, uh, our partners coming out to see what OMF East looks like so they could see it in person. I think people often get scared when we say we want to have this big maintenance facility somewhere along this uh, corridor. Uh, this will open in 2034, uh, regardless of time. This is basically to serve the system itself, north and south of Everett Link. Next slide. So the first question I get, I think, typically when I go to any group, uh, maybe not this group as much, but how come light rail projects take so long to build out? And what you see here is our project schedule for Everett Link. Starting here in 2021 is the first year. We're kicking off planning with this, what we call alternatives development. And essentially, this is a five-year process for planning. Um, we go through three different phases of this uh, for EIS and a final EIS, and I'll get into that if you want. But essentially, after that, we go into design, which takes us another three to four years, then construction. So this entire system, just for this one Everett Link piece, typically takes us about 15 years. And that's in part due to money and just all the planning and, and design engineering construction that goes into it. Next slide. So we're going to talk a little bit about where we're at today with given the time it's today is the ninth. We've got our early scoping process open just through tomorrow. So I'm hoping if some of you haven't commented that you will after this meeting today, but essentially um, right now we're in this early scoping process where we're seeking feedback for the first time on this project for alternatives development for Everett Link. And what we're doing is really trying to engage with a number of stakeholders, groups like this, which you might call interested parties, um, tribal efforts. Uh, that's there's 
I think nine or 10 different tribes that we've identified that we're working with. We have a tribal liaison that, that's helping us with that work. Members of the public, really anyone that is going to be in and around this corridor between today and the next 20 years, we'd love to hear from you. But we've also formed these advisory groups. And if you start on the bottom left here, you've got an interagency group, which is really our jurisdictional partners that we run through, the alignment runs through your city or your county. And th that group is really the workhorse that's doing this, this work with us, evaluating all these alternatives as we bring them to the public, as we bring them to the community advisory group and the elected leadership group. The community advisory group, uh, which I see there's a couple of our members on here today, so it's great to see you both. Uh, this is a group of just people from the community that know and love their community, you know, from different station locations along the corridor that will ultimately send a recommendation to this elected leadership group about what we should study and other alternatives that we should study. And then finally, the elected what? leadership group. Sorry. Oh, I thought I heard some. Uh, the elected leadership group is composed of our Snohomish sub-area members and some local jurisdictional electeds on this group as well with WashDOT. Um, they ultimately are the, the ones that will make a recommendation that goes to the Sound Transit Board to decide what we study further in environmental review and what alternatives. So that's an awful lot of stuff to throw at you, but what I'll basically say to this is that we're in the process right now of figuring out where exactly the stations are and where the locations will actually go. Um, that alignment is a representative alignment that you saw on a few slides ago. That's what the ST3 plan had and what voters voted on. That can deviate a little bit, but as we, we get through this process, we'll start to hone in on what that looks like. So next slide. Um, once again, I just want to show this to you real quickly. These are the partners that are in the IAG group. Um, I'll just go on to the next slide for sake of time. Community advisory group, as I mentioned, we do currently have 20 selected. Uh, they will receive stipends for this work this time around. This is a, a kind of a first for our agency. And the reason we're doing this is because what we want to do is get people in the community that typically don't have a seat at the table because they, you know, they just don't have the time, they're not involved in it already. And really, this is just a group to serve as ambassadors to the communities that they serve and live in. And so what, what I hope to see is as we get into this group and its work, we can have people like Charles and Eldon bring us into this group to do more in-depth dives on stuff. Cause right now I'm just kind of running through everything to get us through it. Um, next slide. And then the elected leadership group, the one takeaway from this, I'll just say it again, is this first bullet for this group is really to identify a preferred alternative and other alternatives to study during environmental review. They make that decision that goes to the Sound Transit Board who ultimately will then make the decision on what we study. Um, so right now is the time for people like you and the community to, to weigh in on this so that you can say, this is what I think about this station, this station, and this station. And we'll get into that here now in the next slide. Uh, just due to time, how are we doing, Brock? Five minutes? Yeah, we got to move here pretty quick. Okay, so uh, this is a, just a process slide of alternatives development, this first phase that I was talking to you about, uh, about in the first three phases of this planning process. And it just kind of shows winter, spring, and fall, where we'll be with this process. And the thing that I want to point out to folks is right now, this, this top right bullet uh, with the feedback, that's early scoping we'll talk about. The second one here in level one, and then the third one at the bottom of this funnel in uh, level two. Those are going to be the opportunities for groups like you individuals to give us feedback on this process and tell us what we're getting wrong, what we're missing, what's, what's right. Next slide. And so that being said, what we're asking from people in this early scoping process, if you haven't already given us input, is to comment on things like I just said, the routes, the station locations, and where that OMF uh, facility might actually be. You can see here in the chat, if I can drop it in, uh, that's the website you can go to. We're open, open through tomorrow on this, so please do comment. Next slide. And I just wanna give an overview of who's visited. So far, we've had 6,500 visitors almost a thousand views on the public webinar we did, 81 people attended the webinars that we did live, and we received 245 comments. So overall, we're, we've got a lot of good feedback from the community on this, but we could use more help trying to pump this out. I know that at this point, if you haven't done it, maybe tomorrow's too soon, but we will have two more opportunities and plenty of opportunities in between uh, for my team to come in and dive deep with you on some of this stuff. And I'm gonna say thank you and pause for one or two questions if we have time. 
Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Eric, uh, for your presentation. And comments are due tomorrow, so uh, go to the website, look at the alternatives, uh, and provide recommendations back to the agency. Um, with that, we're going to go to Kaiser, Nicole. Thank you, Brock. Uh, and I'm going to pull up your presentation, I think. And then we can indirect the comment here. So Lisa, one of the big growth uh, points in the neighborhood is Kaiser Permanente. Uh, they are going to more than double their space. They're a key property owner in the neighborhood. They have a particular and unique model in which they operate. Um, they are already beginning to infuse uh, funding support for health in a broadly defined way in the, in the neighborhood and in the city. Uh, and so with a nexus in our neighborhood of public transit, it, of uh, <clears throat> residential development with uh, industry and business uh, uh, support, uh, health services will become a significant part of the neighborhood. So we thought it would be beneficial for a brief uh, update on the Kaiser Permanente plan. Uh, they've acquired a, a lot of property and are ready to start developing. And so let's keep this to a um, maximum of 10 minutes and less if possible because we have another important agenda item coming up. Nicole, um, we're excited to have you present. Uh, you've been a great partner, uh, including doing one of the cleanup days with me. That was a fun day. Um, so uh, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Brock, and I'm happy to represent Kaiser Permanente on this call. Um, I did have the opportunity to go and do a cleanup with Brock and got to know the organization a little bit through our leadership. My um, boss, Gretchen Benson, sits on the board, and so I've been able to really get to know the work that the ESD is doing up in Everett, and I'm happy to be a part of this meeting. If you could advance the slide, please. So I don't know if any of you have seen this delivery map, but this is our delivery system in Washington. So in 2017, Kaiser Permanente um, acquired Group Health, as you know, and when acquiring them, they made a huge commitment and investment in the Washington region. And as you'll see, we have made significant investments in primary care locations already, including one up in Smoky Point. If you haven't seen it, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, and with our Everett Medical Center. So I know we've heard dates going out and I know everybody wants a date on when that's gonna be completed. Um, and I don't have one for you today. We are working on hopefully getting some updates that we can share with the community, but it's coming. So Everett, Tacoma, Seattle, and Olympia all are getting updates. Specifically in Everett, we will be opening an urgent care center and an ambulatory service center that does day surgeries and things like that. So that is coming. We are working diligently on um, being able to share some plans. But what's continuing are Virtual care, that's not going away, right? So we are upping our virtual care models. Um, pharmacy operations, I work down in our Renton um, campus and we have a warehouse dedicated to mail order pharmacy. And we send out thousands and thousands of prescriptions by mail. So you don't even have to come into a Kaiser Permanente Center to get your prescriptions. It's an amazing, amazing production down there. Every time I walk in that building, I'm, I'm always amazed by the technology and the, the quantity of medications that are sent out via the mail. Home care, and of course, you know, we've seen the increase in mental health um, care over you know, the pandemic in the last few years. So those, those are what we are focusing on. Um, I hope to give you some kind of update soon, but it's coming. What is really cool is that behind the scenes, we are still working really hard on some of our initiatives in the community. If you could advance, please. So, oh, 
Thank you. Um, we are very committed on, oh, Brock, there's our picture. That's my picture from our cleanup day. And I learned so much. It was one of my first assignments was to, to go up and help and learn about the SDA. And it was just the three of us, but I think the three of us probably picked up 12 bags that day. And I got to learn a lot about the organization. So we are always trying to um, be ambassadors in any community that we serve. So we have major initiatives in schools and we have a whole team. We have HR, I'm gonna read off this list because it's so impressive. We have HR, um, our equity inclusion and diversity team, our care delivery team, the facilities team that I work on and our community health and benefit. And we are all here helping to support the Everett and Snohomish County communities um, with these initiatives. So we will be working with the Everett School District in support of STEM education, workforce Snohomish, Everett Community College to bring more externship programs to Snohomish. Now, I've only been with Kaiser Permanente for five months. Um, it, they say it takes five years to get yourself Kaiserized, but during the last five months, I've really seen things come into action with Kaiser. It's not just talking about going out into the community. They are really doing things. Before I came to Kaiser, I worked for Washington STEM, which brings STEM education to disadvantaged communities and youth and those that are generally not um, included in those conversations. Susan Mullaney sat on the board of that. It's one of the reasons that I came to Kaiser Permanente because she, we would talk about equity, we would talk about STEM, we would talk about STEM with young girls, and she would come back to the next meeting with a program in place and, you know, trying to do new things to encourage youth and young adults to, to get into STEM fields, and it was great, and it was inspiring. So we have a huge commitment to a diverse workforce. We've already provided a signature grant, and I think Brock and Ed talked about that. Um, to help get us going. So if you can advance, please. This is a really cool project I've been working on also as diversity suppliers. So I just heard in a meeting earlier that we will by the end of the year have spent over $3 billion as an organization in diversity spend. And that includes not only minority and women owned business, but veteran owned business, LGBTQ businesses, small businesses, local businesses. We track all of that. And I, there is a wonderful um, man in our program office named Lee Chang, who is in charge of putting together all of these metrics and data. And I see it and we go out actively within the community and try to build these relationships, try to get local vendors to reply to our RFPs. We try to partner when we have construction projects to get them hired locally. Kaiser Permanente is committed to um, improving the lives of not only our members, but the communities that we're in. So we also track local spending. I mean, Kaiser Permanente is not in every state in the US. So we wanna make sure that our dollars are spent in the states where our members are and the people and our employees are, right? So we don't have any medical centers in Texas. We wanna make sure our money is being spent in Washington and California and Oregon and the places you know, that we have these heavy presences. So we really do focus on making sure that we are spending our dollars in the correct place and making sure we're giving back to the community. Next slide, please. And then of course, it's advancing care and outcomes to eliminate disparities. So we have cultural responsive um, care, we have bilingual care, we have child care, we have mental health, it is all here for our members. And Kaiser is committed to expanding that footprint. When and how, um, you know, we had to pivot for COVID as many of you did, right? So our medical centers, I being new, I got to drive around to all of them and see that our garages were turned into vaccine clinics. Our, um, administrative building in Renton was turned into a testing center. And we're still, you know, as variants and, and, you know, public health, we follow all of the guidelines. I mean, 
it was amazing to see just the response. And that all comes from a facilities response. So while we've paused a little bit on some of the dates that these new projects will be rolling out, we are still behind the scenes working. I sit in project meetings and planning meetings and care delivery meetings of what we are going to house in each of these specialty centers and what our communities in these areas really need. So we are committed, we are here, and we are here to help the community. And that's it. Any questions? Any questions? Um, I don't, we have no questions in the, in the room here. Um, I wanna thank you for your, um, as you said, your signature investment uh, in Everett with Everett Station District Clients, and we're very excited to launch the Community Collaborative over the next few months uh, to make uh, a transformative change uh, in your community. So thank you. With thank that, you. we're going to shift, I think, to our last agenda item. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me uh, cue this up. The Everett Station District Alliance has been looking at how to sustain the organization and its energy and focus in the, in the neighborhood. And so we really are thinking along two, if you will, program areas or cost centers. One would be um, community development, economic and community development, and the other would be services. In order to be able to deliver the services many property owners in particular and business owners as well are interested in, we are convinced that a business improvement area model in which um, property owners contribute to or invest in services that are prioritized for the neighborhood. We're uh, short on time today. We had planned on 30, 15 minutes of presentation of a BIA concept that's been worked up carefully over the last, uh, actually two years, uh, but focused the last three months based on input and comment from our property owners, business owners, and community. Uh, we don't have 30 minutes left. So Brock is gonna do a presentation on the model that's been developed and I think that's as far as we'll get. We won't be able to have the conversation and uh, discussion that we had anticipated today because we are going to end at two o'clock. So with that said, I think we'll need another forum or another way of having the dialogue and conversation in the neighborhood that's going to be needed. But today we want to make sure you all are clear about where we are in our process and the model that has been developed. So with that, Rob, it's all yours. Uh, at, as I think almost everybody here knows, in 2019, we had an effort to try to launch a business increment area. Um, I'll go into that shortly. Uh, so this is a new proposal based off of our engagement with the board and with uh, asking questions of property owners in the neighborhood over this past year. Based off of that feedback and feedback from the previous time of 2019-2020, this proposal is focused on the critical needs identified. It's right-sized. Uh, it's right-sized to ensure that there's overwhelming support within the boundaries. And that although the boundaries are uh, right-sized, it's a place to grow from. Uh, it's a place to start and then to grow. We know that our neighborhood continues to have challenges around safety, as well as trash and graffiti, and that there are people in need, and that there's opportunity around economic development uh, looking into the future. Um, I'm going to play this video very quickly as to uh, about what is a BIA. This is from the city of Seattle. They have- What are BIAs? Yep. Business improvement areas, or BIAs, also commonly called business improvement districts, are a community-driven means of allocating resources and services to business districts throughout the city. BIAs are not a new concept. In fact, since the 1970s, more than 3,000 BIAs have been established around the world, with 2,500 of those in North America. As of 2016, there are 10 BIAs in Seattle, located in many of the major business districts. And there are several more in the works. 
established by neighbors for neighbors, BIAs enable businesses and properties to come together, connect, and identify various needs to address as a community. What kinds of needs? Well, that's up to you. BIAs within Seattle have been set up for the sake of everything from security and community marketing to streetscape improvements and parking programs. That's the beauty of a BIA. They're designed by those who are invested in and interacting with the neighborhood on a daily basis. Since BIAs vary according to size and physical domain, their scopes and budgets also vary. Think about it this way. A BIA is essentially a fund that can be used to pay for different programs and services. In Seattle, smaller districts maintain budgets ranging from fifty dollars to $250,000 annually, while larger BIAs can raise half a million to several million dollars per year. Typically, BIA funds go towards cleaning, marketing, promotions, and special events. A BIA can run as a single entity or channel its funds into another organization, such as a Chamber of Commerce, to provide services. Everyone involved pays into the BIA and contributes their fair share, empowering local businesses and property owners to oversee improvements collectively. If you're interested in starting a BIA in your district, contact the City of Seattle's Office of Economics. Anyhow, I thought that was a good recap uh, of presenting what is a BIA without me having to do that spiel myself. <laughs> um, so, um, just a quick recap. In 2019, we started the conversation with the steering committee in February. Um, we went through a robust conversation, ultimately submitted uh, a request to city council at the time our threshold was including the city to have more than 50 percent support so we submitted it with 57 percent support of the city and property owners um the city council voted 7-0 in favor but changed the boundary so we needed a second vote which we then went back to collect affidavits uh to be able to confirm the support um and had to come up with a, a boundary and affidavits of where uh, the private property ownership support was about at 60%. Um, but that was right when COVID hit, and we decided now that wasn't the time to pursue it given the economic changes, so we put it on ice. Um, and so it paused uh, to restart at a future time. We started a conversation with the board this past year uh, and then did a community survey. So, uh, again, uh, our next steps after this is obviously today's presentation, continue one-on-one -on -one outreach through presentations. Um, be able to get specific feedback on our proposal uh, and sign up people in support so we know where support level is. And if 60% support exists, then submit it to council. Um, like Ed was saying, uh, our organization is really twofold here as we think about our future. One half is the BIA funded by a of uh, rate payers, property owners who want the services, getting the services funded by them. The other side is our the rest of the conversation that we've had today about the future of the neighborhood, funded mostly by foundations and donations, membership fees on that side. And so uh, you'll see that C shape is very similar to the price chart that I showed for the 2022 budget. Um, so we did do a survey this past year, and what we heard is. 100% uh, of folks want uh, to focus on safety. Almost everybody wants to support on cleaning aspects, with uh, more than half of folks wanting support around parking and uh, enhancing the neighborhood or beautifying it. And so we have focused then on right sizing the BIA uh, with the idea that we provide a proof of concept that we can go back later to expand uh, both the budget and geography in the future once there's effectiveness. So in 2019, we had proposed this pie chart. I'm sorry, the colors don't appear to be coming through in the room very well because it's not so pretty. Um, our updated budget, so this was 490,000 in 2019. Our new budget would be more like 290,000 um, with more of the budget percentage of the budget focused on safe and clean. And also the advocacy portion around and just planning for the future funded, not through this work, but through uh, our foundations and other contributions. Uh, this just kind of shows uh, the actual levels of funds by program area. Um, again, well, there is a reduction in the safety claim. It's also to fewer property owners. 
and a percentage overall increase. Yeah. Um, diving into each of the areas um, within safety, uh, there has been a strong indication that folks would like to see patrols at, at night in particular, that it's uh, really hard to, to take care of that issue at night. And so we have uh, our program staffing, suggest program staffing will be aligned with that, as well as just strong support for daytime ambassadors to continue to monitor. Um, and there was support for physical improvements like lighting. Around the cleaning program, uh, strong support across the board for all of the major things you would expect uh, to, to happen for hypodermic needles to craft right up, and also for uh, graffiti and to some extent of graffiti coatings that need to help apply to those. So together, our proposed program for safe and clean would be nighttime security controls, private security uh, contracted to do that. Um, daytime ambassadors likely also contracted out uh, so we don't have to do staff management but are instead managing the contract. Um, they would be doing multiple things, including uh, patrolling for safety, but also connecting people in need to social services, cleaning up litter and graffiti as they're doing that activity. And then if we if there is a major event in the uh, in the neighborhood, um, being on hand to be there, um, and then also monitoring for parking violations especially around uh, private business parking. Uh, in addition, some funding for major spot cleanups and uh, for uh, physical improvements, like adding public trash needs. Parking program, this is a very small slice on the overall budget, um, but it does tie into the neighborhood ambassadors as just described. Um, we have a large part of the neighborhood is not uh, managed by the city in terms of traffic violations and is managed by the business owners themselves because of the unimproved right of And so we could have a program by which we have a unified approach towards that and then try and the ambassadors can help uh, away from it. So this is something we thought a lot about back in 2019 that we've been carrying forward. Um, around neighborhood enhancement, um, there was really strong support of bringing back the farmer's market uh, within our survey. Um, still a little unclear what our goal would be in that, but if we have dedicated some funding within the budget to help make that happen. Um, it was great uh, up and through uh, up until the pandemic hit uh, when they pulled out. Um, and there would be additional small amounts of funding for physical improvements as well. So in total budget uh, kind of breaks down um, two thirds of the budget is just focused on the number one priority that focus folks identified, which is just having patrols at night and during the day, uh, and the day folks being able to do more than just security issues, but also being able to connect people in need, uh, to social services, and be able to do um, So, uh, up here. Um, key to our approach is to define boundaries so that the people who want the services get the services and those who don't want it generally don't have to as best as we can to have some some boundaries. If there are property owners outside of our defined boundaries, our approach is they could contract in uh, to be included or perhaps the city council wants to do our proposals before we could, could amend it at that time. So looking at where we were with our affidavits in 2020, March of 2020, um, we have come up with four sub areas that we think have a logical connection in each of those areas um, where there is overwhelming support for the BIA uh, for receiving services based off of at that time where our affidavit support was. Um, and so um, this, um, this should be amended to March of 2020, not March of 2019. Oh, future presentations. Uh, so there's the Northwest, Northeast, uh, South McDougal area, and then um, the area that is really uh, centralized around the South End of Virginia, the Smith area. Um, we asked questions within the survey about what would be a fair rate, what would be the preferred rate. Um, there was overwhelming support of just adopting the Downtown Everett Association's rate. Um, however, when we looked at the numbers and applied it to property owners, it became clear it would be a less fair rate. 
uh, just because it's just different types of properties here. And so our previous approach was try to split uh, the amount of revenue coming into the organization based off the rate on land value and land size. And that ends up with a fairly fair rate consistent with last time as well. Um, this does reduce the, this is a lower rate on land value than our previous proposal at 50 cents per thousand dollars of land value. Um, the rates are also fairly consistent with other BIAs, as you can see in the chart. Um, that uh, 50 cents is uh, within the realm uh, per square foot, it's in the realm of the dollar BIA, and four cents is lower than anybody else in terms of uh, four cents per thousand so. dollars. Um, here's a few example assessments of property owners. And, uh, I'm not sure if I didn't ask Compass whether I can share this, but um, it, and looking at uh, five different properties here, uh, what their total assess annual assessment would be uh, based off of their square footage and market value uh, as estimated by the county assessor in 2014. So if you are a property owner here or online, you can get, maybe think about those properties and where you might fit. The other thing is our uh, embedded in our last proposal was a series of accountability measures uh, within the final ordinance. Um, our petition would include all of those accountability measures uh, directly in the petition. Um, first of all, is starting smaller, uh, which makes it a little bit more accountable moving forward. Um, it would require renewal after five years. There's a very structured rate pair board. Um, the budget is also smaller uh, and has to be approved annually by three different bodies. Uh, the rate payer board, the, the rate payers, um, who are the property owners paying into the system, um, and the city. And then there's the performance metrics set by the rate payer board and reported to, to the rate payers at the annual rate payer. So what's new? More focus on safety and cleaning uh, with nighttime uh, private controls. Boundaries are right sized to those who most want the service. The budget is smaller, the lower rates, um, and the overhead costs are decreased. Uh, last time would be a full time uh, director of the, of the uh, overseeing the BIA, in this case, would be a part time program manager. And there's the increased transparency and accountability measures built in. That, that concludes my presentation. So it's a significant revision and it's based on a lot of input from uh, property owners and business owners throughout the area. Uh, it's uh, designed to be a separate component service delivery from the community development work that uh, we are doing. It's um, our hope that uh, we can uh, have input from property owners and affirmation of interest in supporting this and or tweaking it. Uh, this will go to the board of directors next Thursday to authorize uh, the next steps in the process. And our hope is that in the early uh, 2022 that we'll be able to present this to uh, city administration and city council. Um, so, we don't have time to discuss it and uh, answer questions. If there are questions, put them in the chat or send an email to Brock. He's assembling all of the comments and, and input at this time. And we'll be rolling out a uh, process of talking with property owners. And uh, that could be a combination of individual conversations and, uh, and group uh, uh, presentations. So I apologize that we don't have time for further discussion. I really want to honor our two o'clock and it's 201 at this moment. So we're going to adjourn uh, the meeting uh, feeling good about having gotten this presentation in there with the little bit of time overrun that, that we experienced today. So I hope this was a helpful meeting to all of the members and uh, catches you up on a lot of work that's happened this year and a lot of work that's uh, going forward into 2022.
So with that, uh, we will adjourn the meeting.